Bible reading is taken from Acts chapter 1, verses 12 to 26. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, Brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas, who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in our ministry. With the payment he received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong. His body burst open and all his intestines spilled out. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this. So they called that field in their language, a kaldama, that is, field of blood. For, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, may this place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in it, and may another take his place of leadership. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these there must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they nominated two men, Joseph, called Barsabbas, also known as Justus, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias, so he was added to the eleven apostles. Amen. In our Bible passage this morning, we meet the disciples following Jesus' ascension into heaven. Having met with the risen Jesus on several occasions, they are now on their own again, and they make a Sabbath day's walk from the Mount of Olives back to the city of Jerusalem and the upstairs room where they are staying. A Sabbath day's walk would have only taken them about 15 minutes, as the Jewish law um, laid down a strict limitation on how far you were allowed to walk on the Sabbath day before it was classed as work. Going back to the upstairs room reminds us of what they did following Jesus' crucifixion, doesn't it? When they all hid behind locked doors for fear of the authorities coming after them too. Was it the same upper room? We don't know exactly. It could have been, but it could also have been the house, the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark where later members of the Jerusalem church would meet to pray. We don't know the exact location of the upper room, but we do know that they went there in obedience to the instructions Jesus gave them before he ascended into heaven. Acts 1 verse 4 tells us, on one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem but wait for the gift my father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptised with water, but in a few days you will be baptised with the Holy Spirit. That promise was made right at the start of Jesus' ministry. If we turn our minds back to the Jordan River, 
and John the Baptist calling people to repent of their sins and be baptised. We can read in Luke 3.15, the people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John was the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptise with water, but one more powerful than I will come, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So the disciples are waiting, waiting for that promise to be fulfilled. Not just the 11 remaining disciples, who we heard named in that reading, but also the women. Luke doesn't name the women here, but among them would be Mary Magdalene, Joanna and Susanna, the three women mentioned in his gospel as supporting Jesus and his disciples out of their own means during Jesus' ministry. They would be there along with Mary, the mother of James, and others who found the tomb empty and to whom the risen Jesus revealed himself. And there is particular mention of Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. They had also taken their place among the believers. Jesus' family had struggled during Jesus' early ministry, but following his crucifixion and resurrection, they too were converted and they took their place as they all joined together constantly in prayer. There is no better way to spend a time of waiting, is there, than to pray. To wait on God's will and perfect timing. To bring everything to God in prayer. What an example they are to the, us at in the church today. It doesn't say a few of them met and continually prayed, or one or two of them met and continually prayed. It said they all met together. We are told that the number of believers who met in that upper room was about 120. Why was Luke so precise in recording that number. In Jewish law, 120 is the minimum number of Jewish men required to establish a new community with its own council, a synagogue. So it has been suggested that Luke is telling us that the disciples of Jesus are already numerous enough to form a new community, that they were a leg legitimate group. Luke emphasises their togetherness. Acts 1 verse 14, as I've just said, says they all join together in prayer. Homo thymodon is the word that translates as togetherness. And it's a favourite word of Luke's. Now that word, translated as togetherness, could simply mean the disciples met in the same place or were doing the same thing but later describes both united prayer and a united decision. So the togetherness here goes beyond the assembly and the activity to agreement about what they are praying for. They were of one mind and purpose. They were persistent in prayer. They are a good example towards the church today, aren't they? <coughs> I wonder if it was while they were praying that Peter was reminded of the scriptures and the need to fulfil them. The need to find from their number a replacement for Judas. This group of 120 or more needed a leader, didn't they? And in this passage we see Peter stepping up into this role, taking his place as he stands and addresses the group. As they met together and reflected on recent events, 
on Jesus' resurrection appearances to them as a group and to individuals, his ascension into heaven, it would be reasonable to expect that they also talked about Judas, his betrayal and his death. After all, he'd been one of them for three years. He'd received the call from Jesus that each of them had received. He had heard Jesus preach and sat at his feet as he taught them. They would be struggling to come to terms with what had happened, wouldn't they? The betrayal of Jesus, but also his death. Maybe it reminded them of Peter's denial of Jesus and the way all of them ran away and in effect deserted Jesus. As Peter stood up to speak to the group, was he conscious of the need to get things right this time? We don't know what Peter was thinking, do we? But let us remind ourselves what Peter said. Acts 1.16 Brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas, who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in our ministry. Peter then describes how Judas died and the purchase of the field and the name given to it, Akel. Akeldma, field of blood. A description that is believed to have been added by Luke for the benefit of the readers of the gospel rather than what Peter was saying to the a group of disciples that day, as they would already know the circumstances of Judas' death and burial. They would know what that field was. Peter also quotes two Psalms, Psalm 69 and Psalm 109. And he says this, it is written in the book of Psalms, may this place be deserted, let there be no one dwell in it. And then and may another take his place. And this was Peter's reasoning for finding from among their group a replacement for Judas to make them 12 again, to make them complete. These two scriptures were to Peter and the believers adequate guidance on the need to replace Judas with the knowledge, but along with the knowledge that Jesus himself drew a parallel between the 12 apostles and the 12 tribes of Israel. The number of its members must not be depleted. As I was reading round this passage, as I prepared for today, the view was held by some commentators is that Peter here is being his usual impulsive self, that he jumped the gun in seeking to replace Judas, that he should have waited for the Holy Spirit to come. And they also say that God intended Paul to be the one who filled that place. Part of the argument for this is that we never hear of Matthias again, whereas Paul, following his own personal encounter with Jesus on the Damascus Road, became a very prominent leader in the early church. Whether Peter did right or wrong in making this decision, we don't know. We won't know this side of heaven, I guess. But it is in itself a lesson for the church today, a model to follow. Firstly, they studied the scriptures and were led by scripture to understand that a replacement should be made. They didn't pick it out of their own thoughts. Secondly, they used their common sense in coming up with a criteria for who would make a suitable replacement. If Judas' substitute was to have the same apostolic ministry as they had, he must have the same qualifications. And this included 
having an eyewitness experience of Jesus. In other words, they needed to know Jesus personally and not have just heard about him from others. Acts 1.21 tells us, Therefore it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time Jesus was taken from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. And as a result of their praying and of their seeking the scriptures and also their common sense, they came up with two names, Justus and Matthias. The way they chose to choose between these two men would not be our way, would it? They cast lots. But they also prayed. Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which one you have chosen. Casting lots was sanctioned in Old Testament times as a way of making decisions, as a way of discerning God's will. So that method, along with prayer, they really believed that they were choosing Jesus' own choice. Whatever we think, this group of disciples firmly believed that Matthias was Jesus' choice and he took his place among the twelve. Taking your place in an established group can be a daunting process, can't it? I can remember when I was first asked if I would consider being a circuit steward for ministers, ministers feeling really nervous and inadequate, especially the first time I met with the more experienced ministers and stewards, and particularly as the person I was taking over from had rather big shoes to fill. I couldn't have been more different. But in making my decision, I felt that it was, God, was God's decision too. I was on a, a weekend, weekend's course at Bawtree Hall, and on the first evening, we gathered in the foyer prior to dinner, and one of the leaders of the course introduced us to Lecto Divina, a way of reading the Bible, a Bible passage, slowly and more than once, and just letting it s speak to you. They asked if anyone felt that something had jumped out at them, and quite out of character, I said, I, I did. And the words that jumped out at me were, the time is now. The time is now. Was that the Holy Spirit giving me a push in my decision making? I think it was. The time is now. So those members of the early church were led by scripture. They used their common sense and they prayed continuously. And Matthias was added to their number, a true witness to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Now, Matthias may not have been a name at the forefront of the continuing mission of the apostles. We may never hear from him again, but maybe he became one of those unknown common saints who carried the love of Jesus into unmarked common streets and witnessed for Christ in unheralded, unheralded and ordinary ways. Maybe Matthias is the model of the countless millions of unlikely disciples whose story is never told, whose song is never sung, whose honour is never praised but are the ones who make all the difference. Ordinary people like you and me. People who minister to the person they meet in the street or sit next to on the bus. 
People who share God's love with their neighbours through acts of kindness. Those people who never take on a leadership role, but who live out their Christian discipleship day in, day out. Very often only seen by Jesus and the people they help. Each one of you here this morning are called to take your place, to bear the light of Christ into the world. Your main qualification, you know Jesus. We may never know if the election of Matthias was the first great mistake the church made or if it was exactly what was needed to happen before God's Holy Spirit could move in their midst. But one thing we do know is that God's Spirit moved anyway, redeeming their mistakes, renewing their faith, reviving their courage and revolutionising their witness for the sake of the name of Jesus Christ. We are not unlike that early church, are we? We have been through a time of change, a time of waiting. So is there a sense in which we too need to wait for the Holy Spirit to come on us to renew our strength, our commitment and our energy so that we can take our place as witnesses to Jesus' life, death and resurrection with new energy and new conviction. Do you know Jesus? Will you come and take your place? Amen.